Hi, welcome to Jimmy's Records and Tapes. I'm Jimmy Pardo. Today we're going to be talking about 1981. I'm loving music again. Hey everybody, welcome to Jimmy's Records and Tapes. I am Jimmy Pardo, and I'm also wearing a shirt that's way too small for me. This is an actual shirt that will come up later in this episode. It's too small. It once was too big, but it's actual. It's real, man, and that's what this show's all about. We're talking about 1981. Let's talk about what was happening in the world in 1981. Charles and Diana got married. Uh, remember that wedding? MTV launched. Simon and Garfunkel reunited in Central Park uh, to have that big concert. Sandra Day O'Connor became the first female Supreme Court Justice. And sadly, uh, Pope John Paul II was shot. He didn't die. He just was shot. It reminds me that I went to see the Pope uh, when he visited Chicago at Quincy College. Uh, uh, my friends and I um, uh, played hooky from school to go see the Pope because we thought, well, if we get in trouble for playing hooky, we can say, well, we went to see the Pope. He can't be mad at us for seeing the Pope. If you follow me on Twitter or Never Not Funny, boy, do you know how religious I am. So, of course, it's very important I see the Pope. Also went as the Pope for Halloween that year. I was obsessed with the Pope. What child is obsessed with the Pope? What am I, a cast member of the Goldbergs? Here's what your money gets you in 1981. Gas is going to cost you a buck and a quarter. A house, $78,200. And you're sick of washing your own dishes? Well, guess what, my friends? We could automate that. Uh, we got an under-counter dishwasher that will, and I'm amazed by how cheap this is, 250 bucks. Doesn't that seem cheap for, a, for an appliance in 1981? It seems like it should be like I'm missing a zero there. Typo? Hope not. Musically, here's what was happening in 1981. The best-selling song was Betty Davis Eyes by Kim Carnes. The best-selling album was... Last week's uh, topic, uh, Ario Speedwagon's High Infidelity. Um, the Grammy, new artist, went to Sheena Easton. And the Grammy Award for Best Album went to John Lennon and Yoko Ono's Double Fantasy. But we're not going to talk about award-winning albums here today. No, sir. We're going to talk about Jim Steinman's Bad for Good. Now, you might know Jim Steinman. He wrote uh, and is most closely associated with Meatloaf. Uh, because he wrote uh, All of Bad Out of Hell and uh, All of Bad Out of Hell 2 and I believe All of Bad Out of Hell 3. Uh, this guy likes the bat, man. He loves it. Um, this album, this uh, Jim Steinman Bad for Good, was supposed to be Meatloaf's second album, but Meatloaf ended up having a, a throat problem, so he couldn't release it in a timely manner. There's also the rumor that maybe Meatloaf hated the album and uh, didn't want to record it, and luckily he had this throat trouble. Or did he ever have the throat trouble? I don't know. There's a lot of uh, conspiracy theories out there, man, and right in time, too. 1981, it's about time we get to the bottom of what was going on with Meatloaf and Steinman in 81. This album went to number 63 on the Billboard chart. Now, here's the thing. Meatloaf did end up recording, and this maybe debunks some of the conspiracy theories. He ended up uh, recording some of the songs on this album. He ended up recording um, Surf's Up, he ended up recording uh, Rock and Roll Dreams Come Through, Out of the Frying Pan Into the Fire, Lost Boys and Golden Girls, the title track Bad for Good, and also uh, a song called Left in the Dark, uh, which also um, was recorded by Barbara Streisand at one point. Now, Meatloaf does a great version. Streisand does a good version. But this is weird. I like Jim Steinman's version better for that song and kind of some of these other ones because he's not a great singer. He's a songwriter. He's a producer. And he, but he has a rawness to his voice, kind of the way that Jimmy Webb does or Paul Williams does uh, for their songs. Um, he's got a rawness where you hear the heartache in this song, Left in the Dark, which is basically about a dude uh, waiting for his wife or girlfriend to come home. Uh, she promised him he'd be there at seven o'clock. Now it's a quarter to three. Um, so get undressed, let's let's just go to bed and forget the, what you're doing, uh, basically cheating on me. And the rawness really comes through, and it's heartbreaking. It's a heartbreaking song, Jim Steinman's version. Um, what I'm not proud to say is that I once played this song uh, in a passive-aggressive way to accuse a girlfriend of cheating on me. Spoiler alert, she was. Hey guys, it's now time for this week's quick hit. Uh, this week I'm talking about Lee Rittenauer's Is It You? Now, Lee Rittenauer is uh, best known as a jazz guitarist. He was a um, also a session player, very much in demand as a session guy. Uh, in fact, he plays on Pink Floyd's uh, Run Like Hell, 
off the Pink Floyd The Wall album, uh, he was brought in to kind of uh, thicken that up, to thicken the sound up, to heavy it up. Uh, why they chose a jazz guitarist, I don't know. Maybe he's very versatile. Mind your business about why they chose Lee Rittenauer. Um, but the song, Is It You, went to number 15 on the Billboard chart, and it is part of his album, Rit, which has uh, other great songs on it, like um, uh, Mr. Briefcase, uh, which is sung by Eric Tagg, and Bill Champlin uh, is also on this album, who was a session vocalist at the time, and also from the Sons of Champlin, who went on to join the band Chicago on uh, their 16th album. Um, I was not aware of Lee Rittenauer until the day that I went to Chicago Fest in 1981. My friend Gary Shera, uh, who is a musician himself and uh, has done quite well for himself, lives in Nashville and uh, plays keyboards, went on tour with a bunch of people. Uh, he and I were in high school together and he said, hey, a group of us are going to go see Chicago, the band, at Chicago Fest um, tomorrow. Would you like to join us? And I was like, yeah, I'm in on that. That sounds great. Um so we were taking the train uh, from Oak Forest down to Navy Pier. Now, the cool thing about Chicago Fest is it was a celebration of music and food. So they had various different stages, shows going on at the exact same time. They'd have a rock stage, like for instance, uh, Iron Maiden at one point. They were they, they were a, a group that would play on the rock stage and not the main stage. Um, Cheap Trick, I believe the same thing. There was a comedy stage, there was a country stage. So you can get whatever you wanted at Chicago Fest. We were at the main stage to see Chicago and opening act Lee Rittenauer. Uh, in fact, I believe that year, Chicago set a record um, for Chicago Fest, 150,000 people went to that concert. Um, but we didn't have to worry about that because we left very early because Gary insisted that we leave early so we could sit in the front row. So I meet the gang at the train station to go downtown and the gang consisted of Gary and his girlfriend, Karen, a girl named Sue and her boyfriend, Mike. And here's the fifth wheel that stuck tagging along like a little child with these two uh, couples. I thought a group was going. It turns out uh, five of us went. They didn't seem to mind. I, of course, was in my head because I'm nuts. Um, we get down there. The gate's open. We get the front row just like Gary wants. And um, the opening act is Lee Rittenauer. He's terrific. He does these songs we just spoke of. And then Chicago comes on. Now, it was only the second concert I had ever been to. I went to see Kiss on their Dynasty tour in 1979. It was uh, me, my brother, and my stepbrother, Ron, and we were there with my mom, which at the time was like, oh, you're going with your mom, man? What a th my mom was 32 at the time, so if anybody really should be at that show, it should have been her and not the children. You know, people around, you know, getting high, doing their thing at a concert, throwing toilet paper at each other, and uh, here's a 12-year-old and a 10-year-old and a 9-year-old uh, going to see these cartoon characters. And then my mom jumping up and down, yelling, show me the tongue, which I didn't understand at the time. This was my second concert, Chicago, Chicago Fest. I'm just one of 150,000 people. Smaller group, one of five, awkward. Chicago takes the stage. Uh, they are in a little transitional period uh, in that they uh, their last couple of albums didn't do all that great and they didn't have the comeback in 1982 yet. And they take the stage, they're doing hit after hit. Um, and I wanted to know the band members' names. I remember that was very important to me. I don't know why, but it was. And Peter Cetera, uh, was, who was very much the front man at this point, after its songs, he would like tell you who wrote it, but he would do it very quickly. So, and it was mumbled or, or maybe, uh, hey, there's Jimmy! And like away from the microphone where I didn't really understand what he was saying. Uh, I do remember that after Saturday in the Park, uh, which was written by Robert Lamb and sung by Robert Lamb, uh, he says, Saturday in the Park, Bobby Lamb! And so then I, that gave me the opportunity to obsess for several songs of, is it Bob E. Lamb? Is it Bob E. Period Lamb? What is that man's name? And then he kind of just stopped saying people's names, uh, probably just to drive me bananas. And finally he says, uh, well, let me introduce the band. And I'm like, here we go. And he goes, all right, over there on sack. Oh, you know everybody. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. I don't know everybody. Uh, so I got to obsess about that uh, in addition to um, uh, being the fifth wheel. It also gives me the opportunity to obsess about this shirt, which I actually bought that day at Chicago Fest, uh, which it probably was too big at the time, but now it's way too small, so I can't wait for this episode to end so I can take this damn thing off.
Hey, everybody, that is this week's Jimmy's Records and Tapes. I thank you for watching. Uh, if you liked it, hit that like button, subscribe. Uh, also, you can find me at, at Jimmy Pardo on Twitter. I also host the award-winning podcast, Never Not Funny. Thank you so much for watching. Until next week, the record's back in the sleeve. <laughs>